Good morning, and uh, welcome to our Sunday morning message from Kalamazoo Chinese Christian Church. We're glad that you're with us wherever you are, and whether in our audience or uh, online, we sure appreciate you joining us to hear the Word of God, and our purpose as we come together is to, uh, I hate to use the word educate, but cause us to have an understanding and to learn the Word of God. I, I really believe that two deficits that we have in the church today is, number one, a deficit when it comes to leadership, and number two, understanding and knowledge of the Word of God. And I wanna be a good leader, I wanna be a, a good pastor, a good shepherd, but I feel that um, there is a priority to focus on the teaching, the preaching of the Word of God, so that when someone says, well, what is the book of Galatians about? You say, well, it's, uh, it's about, and go into a detail. Uh, we're, in the, we're in the book called the Acts, or the activities, the actions of the early church. And I really believe that this book gives us a pattern as to how we, the people of God, should live, how we should learn, how we should serve, and how we as God's people on earth should build the kingdom, the coming kingdom, as well as the present kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven that is within us, looking forward to that time when we'll be caught up together with God's people to meet the Lord in the air and to be forever with the Lord and to see the King in all his glory. What a glorious day that will be. So let's start off this morning with a couple of songs. Uh, I, one of my absolute favorites, and it happens to be a Gaither song. There's something about that name. Uh, we'll go ahead and ask our brother to come and join us here and get started with some worship and praise music. Glad Brother Tim's there. <laughs> Sometimes I don't pick this thing up right. Let's uh, sing to the Lord and lift up his holy name. Jesus, 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 there's just something above that they Savior Jesus, like the fragrance after the rain. Jesus, 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 let all heaven and earth proclaim. Something about that day. 
kings and kingdoms long pass away, but there's something Wonderful name of Jesus. Our second opening song is Gentle Shepherd. And we have a, a gentle shepherd. I think of David who could say, The Lord is my shepherd, and I have everything I need. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And I pray that today uh, he will be the satisfaction of our souls. Let's sing together. Gentle Shepherd, come and lead us. Gentle shepherd, come and lead us, for we need you to help us find our way. Gentle shepherd, come and feed us, for we from day to and in our previous chapters, we've looked at the very beginnings, the very earliest actions, activities of the church. Uh, we, we looked at the day of Pentecost. We called that the birthday of the church, the day that the Holy Spirit of God came down to indwell believers and to be a help to us. Jesus predicted that. Uh, particularly in John chapters 14, 15, and 16, and in those teachings that John gives us regarding the Holy Spirit, that he would send another comforter, uh, another one to counsel us, another one to go with us, but who will go with us by indwelling us and empowering us and allowing us to have his not only knowledge but strength. Uh, to make another day. And so day by day as the people of God, uh, it's wonderful to know that this, and, and I know people refer to the Holy Spirit as the third person of the Godhead. I'm not real comfortable with that because Romans chapter eight, in speaking of the Holy Spirit, uh, gives several names, several titles, uh, the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, but then it says the Spirit of Christ. And if Christ, 
dwell in you, okay? So we have within us, and, and it says also the very power that raised Jesus our Lord from the dead and that Christ dwells in us. And so you can't do better than that. The hymn writer could say, Christ liveth in me. He lives within me. And I, I rejoice in that this morning because I couldn't do what I'm doing. I wouldn't be here were it not for his divine presence that God dwells within us by faith and he dwells within us by his very presence. Well, things moved along. There were situations that arose and I'm gonna say that anytime there's something new, uh, perhaps because of our being unfamiliar, uh, the newness of a movement, uh, I, I think sometimes even our excitement gets in the way. We experience what we have never felt before. We come in contact with issues and situations that we have not previously known. It only makes sense that as we acclimate to and, and as we involve ourselves in, in things that are different, things unfamiliar to us, that uh, we would have uh, perhaps at times, I, I, should I say confusion? Um, Yes, because God is not the author of confusion. And when we have confusion, that just drives us to him. Uh, when I sense confusion in the ministry, when I sense confusion in my in my day-to-day -day experiences, I need to cry out to God and say, this confusion is not from you. Uh, strengthen me, help me, uh, encourage me today. Uh, this confusion needs to be driven away by your presence. And as we are in our humanity, that's something that we learn. Even Jesus, uh, the word of God tells us in the book of Hebrews, though he were a son, and we know him as the son, the very son of God, uh, Hebrews chapter one says, God who at different times and in different ways spoke in past times by the fathers to the prophet by the father or by the prophets to the fathers hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son and then it says in chapter 5 though he were a son the very son of god yet he learned obedience by the things that he suffered and so there were human experiences things that god in his almighty presence and person uh, came into contact with as a man that were new to him. And you might say, I, I, I'm really not sure about that. I, I haven't heard that before. Uh, but how could Jesus say that he has been tempted in all points like as we are, of course, yet without sin, if he didn't, have that situation of struggling with the human experience. Uh, the surprise, perhaps, that friends would turn against him. Uh, can you imagine, though he knew in his infinite wisdom and foreknowledge the, uh, the prognosis of God that Judas would turn against him, it, it had to be a surprise that caused him to say, uh, you're going to betray the Son of God with a kiss? Come on. So, just as you and I are taken aback, uh, just as you and I experience things that would seem to uh, want to throw us off course, Jesus also experienced those things, and wonderfully, uh, I, I love how John says that Knowing all things that were before him, he went forth. He went ahead. And I'm thankful for that example because there are times when I feel like quitting. There are times when I feel like getting uh, something different. I feel like giving up. And it's wonderful to have the example of our Lord Jesus Christ who says, look, I'm there with you. I'm there within you. Uh, not only that, I'm here ahead of you and I'm leading you as a shepherd goes forth before his sheep, calling them by name. And I, I hope that each of us uh, 
have more and more of that as we're walking with the Lord, realizing that the gentle shepherd is calling our name and we can see him there going that way before us. As I was a boy growing up, there was a song that was a favorite of my grandfather's and it goes like this. Do not fear the bend in the road. Neither let thy soul feel any fear. Travel on with confidence and know there is one who always will be near. Do not fear the bend in the road. It is safe for thee forevermore. There is one who knows every step you take. He has traveled that way before. So uh, wonderful to have that confidence in our Savior, in our Shepherd, the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, we had some up and downs in chapters uh, three and four and five, uh, even a couple of jail, a couple of prison experiences. Uh, one of them may be just perplexing, the other one a manifestation of the presence of God and the miracle of an angel coming and opening the doors of the cell and allowing for the, uh, the apostles to go forth and uh, in the next morning, the, the guards, uh, they opened the cell doors to look within and they didn't find anybody there, but uh, they found them uh, very shortly in town, in the temple, uh, doing exactly what they had been arrested for, preaching and teaching the word of God. And amazingly, the attitude of the disciples of the Lord, the attitude of the apostles was this. They considered it, they, they, they saw it as being something to, uh, well, they gloried in the fact that they were able to suffer for his name's sake and uh, that, that God would count them worthy to be able to do so. And so in chapter 5, they left the presence of the council. They rejoiced that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for the name of Christ. And daily in the temple and in every house, they did not stop preaching and teaching Jesus Christ. And we, we made reference to them as the unstoppables, God's uh, uh, super agents to take forth his word empowered by his very presence. So here we are in chapter six. And as you can imagine, just when things are going good, uh, just when it seems you're getting a handle on doing the impossible and you're sensing the presence of God and it seems that nothing can throw you off course and nothing can stop you, um, trouble comes. And what we have in chapter six isn't that trouble approached the Christians. It's not that something as they had before, came to them from the outside. But this is a situation of trouble from within. Let's take a look at it. And in those days, verse 1, when the number of the disciples was multiplied, that's success, that's blessing, there arose a murmuring, or we would maybe say today, grumbling, a murmuring of the Grecians, the Greek language, those from the Greek culture, those perhaps uh, uh, that they were more representative of the culture of that day, uh, the Roman Empire that had taken over the Greek Empire. There arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews, the Jewish people of the old line, perhaps many of them actually speaking the Hebrew language. <laughs> Can I say we have a bilingual church here? Uh, so our situation at Kal Kalamazoo Chinese Christian Church is nothing new, and it's nothing that unusual. Uh, as you go through town and uh, myself coming from Battle Creek, we have several congregations that speak more than one language, particularly uh, Spanish and English. And then, of course, in the other cultures, whatever their language happens to be, uh, mixed with 
part of the congregation that speaks English. Here we are with three languages, pre predominant at KCCC, the Mandarin language, the Cantonese language, and of course, those of us that speak English. But here there's a murmuring, and it doesn't just have to do with the difference of language. It has to do with a coming together and a difference of two cultures. Um, it has to do with a difference in diet. It has to do with a difference in attitude about what is considered to be a fair portion of food versus maybe others that seem to be receiving more than their fair share. Of course, than those that are feeling neglected. There arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows, women who had lost their life partner, they were neglected in the daily ministration. In other words, like we have here at Kalamazoo Chinese Christian Church, uh, they had a meal, they had provision at least in the service or after the service and perhaps even during the week, uh, we heard that there was this sharing amongst the people of God. Those who had plenty shared with those who seemed to have less than what they need so that there was no lack amongst the people of God. But in our first verse, it says, oops, something developed. And it happened along can I say cultural, even racial lines? This is the difference between Jew and Gentile here. Uh, it happened to a special needs group. Women who didn't have daily support coming from the man of the house, who in his employment uh, would provide for them. And so there was a specialized ministry going on within the church. Now, whether or not it was something that was specially developed, I don't know. It may have just become apparent that while we're serving our meals, this is something that the widows really appreciate, but the, um, the non-Jewish women who were in this special condition felt that they were being left out. Wow. Perhaps just an oversight. Uh, I looked at this because I, I had a friend once uh, who did not believe in Sunday school. And um, he said, there's not a verse in scripture for Sunday school. And, and I took him to Acts chapter six. And I said that God has given us examples. He's given us a pattern to meet particular, to meet specific needs. And here in the church in Jerusalem, there was an apparent large number of widows and the church took on special interest. In fact, what we're going to be looking at here in chapter six is a whole new arrangement within the leadership and the service of the church that we call deacons. This is, this is where the deacons in the church have their start. This is the introduction of that unique group of servants that God has called to work within as well as outside the church for specific and specialized needs. Then the 12, the 12 apostles, called the multitude of the disciples unto them, and they said, it's not reason, or we would say it's not reasonable for us to leave the word of God and do the work, do the service of waiting on tables. God has called us to preach and teach the word. That's for us a full-time occupation. The church has grown dramatically, has actually grown by thousands. There's a lot of instruction. There's a lot of teaching that's needed, that's necessary here. And all of a sudden, we're faced with this situation of 
improper amounts, improper, unsatisfactory uh, distribution of foodstuffs at the feast or at the meals of the church. And of course, uh, the disciples would be looked at as the people involved in troubleshooting, as well as perhaps many times looked at as the answer to the problem. And you can imagine the members of the church coming to uh, Simon Peter, coming to Andrew, James, John, Philip, Thomas, Matthew, uh, the other disciples, and saying, we've got a problem out in the kitchen. Uh, we've got a situation going on in the dining room where there's some real grumbling going on, and things were going so well, and now there's this uh, help. And, um, you know, it can get to be where even in the regard of the pastors at a church, in the regard of the oversight, the ministry that God has called to lead and to teach, that uh, I remember a few years ago as I was driving downtown Battle Creek, I went past a, a church, I'm not going to give you the name, it's still there, and here was the pastor probably 15 minutes before the service, and he was out shoveling the snow from the sidewalk. And I pulled over and I addressed him by name and I said, what are you doing out here shoveling the snow? And he said, somebody's got to do it. And I thought of my situation where if I was outside breathing that cold air and then come inside to preach a sermon, I wouldn't have had a voice. I don't know how he did it. But there is a need for these type things, service type work and responsibilities to be done and you couldn't have the apostles you can't have pastoring staff to do everything uh, to make sure that all things are in order there's a need for servant workers the scripture refers to them as deacons to be able to come alongside in the ministry and to be able to address specific needs and make sure that these things are done so that the work of ministering the word and teaching and, and preaching the gospel and the other essential functions of the body of Christ can go on without hindrance. So it says it's not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. So brethren, look ye out among you. Now, they didn't say, you know, there are, there are businesses uh, in Jerusalem that cater. Uh, there are businesses in our town here that, that serve at weddings and at different other arrangements and public events that know just the best way to handle food service. Uh, we should reach out to them and let's, uh, let's just uh, sublet this so that it's not a church concern at all. We got the money, my goodness, we, we just grew in number by thousands and we think, wow, we're, we can hire someone to come in and do, no. <laughs> the apostle said, look ye out among yourselves. And they chose, and I like this, the number seven, which is the number of completion, but they saw that seven would be able, capable of doing this work. Look ye out among you seven. This doesn't mean that the church has to limit themselves to seven deacons. Look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. Wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. You're saying that in order to serve tables and to choose this group of individuals to do so, their qualifications would be that of honesty, being filled with the Holy Spirit, and wisdom. Well, you know what we're going to find out? Those qualifications, as they suited as they fit these individuals for this service 
of making sure that there was equality, of making sure that there was a fairness met out in the, in the distribution of the food is the way to fix the problem. Uh, as we read on further, we're gonna find out that this was like a calling card of those that God would extend in their service who ultimately and eventually would take other responsibilities on, and we're gonna to get to that, that they were, why well, they were, they were capable of much more than just running a, a food service business. They were good businessmen, they were honest. Uh, they were good servants to come alongside and serve the Lord. They were full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. And they were appointed specifically over this business. There's, there's business in the church. Um, there's matters having to do with repair of, of things having to do with building structure, the electricity bill, uh, snow removal, uh, those dumpsters out there, and, and we recycle at this church, the need for us to make sure that someone is, you know, taking care of those things so that the testimony of the body of Christ at KCCC is looked upon and people say, you know, that's a well-run church. So these deacons were appointed over this business, over this service, and the apostle said that allows us to remain free, that we give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Um, it should be obvious to you as you're hearing this that God desires order in the church. It's obvious as we look at the book of Acts and as we study the apostles' doctrine that the church of God, the body of Christ, is a place of rule, those that God has appointed as leadership, and order, not rules and orders. I've seen churches that are run that way, and it's not a smooth operation. But when we understand rule and order in the house of God, and we also see our place in the body of Christ as to what God has called us to do, and those things where we have our ability as well as our ambition and interest. You know, if you have someone in your church that's a, a, a licensed accountant, or someone within your church that has other uh, professional expertise, why, then may maybe that accountant should be on the treasury staff to take care of the finances and so forth. And uh, different others, if you've got someone that does heating and air conditioning, well, they're the ones who expect a telephone call on that Sunday morning when the church is either ice cold or uh, kind of overheating and it's just neat to be able to use someone from within the church to meet those needs and to use their special God-given abilities, not only for the work that they do outside the church, but the business of the church. And that allows the pastoral staff, that allows the Sunday school staff, uh, those that have other responsibilities as to their ability, to be able to do what God has given them to do. Verse five says the saying or the suggestion pleased the whole multitude and look at who they chose, seven men. Uh, first of all, Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost and Philip and Prochorus and Nicanor and Timon and Parmenas and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. And you might say, okay, yeah, that's seven. But look at the names of these men that are appointed to do this deacon work, this service work. 
There are those that are Hebrew names. There are those also that are Greek names. I doesn't everybody know Nick the Greek? And by the way, the interesting thing about Nicholas, he was a proselyte from Antioch. He was an individual who had converted. He had come from out of Judaism and had come to Christ. He was a convert to Christianity. He would be able to supply a real balance among the Greek men as well as the Jewish men, the Hebrew men. And by the way, he's also the seventh member of the deacon, can I say the deacon board or the deacon staff. He's the tiebreaker. Oh, there's going to be times when the vote is three to three. So now what do we do? We're back in the same predicament. That we've, we've got, we've got uh, Nick the Greek, and he understands both sides. And he's able to step in and in wisdom and fairness and honesty, able to help make sure that those times where it seems the brethren are at loggerheads as to how they should go and what direction they should take. It's wonderful to have the seventh man and to know that in the staff, in the order of things in the church, that there is someone who understands both sides. Nick the Greek. Who they set before the apostles and sent them out to do their work. No, no. Let's not miss a step here. They set them before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. They went about this in a godly fashion. They went about this with order and discipline. They went about this in the same fashion that they would have done in any other regard. In fact, I think they did this better than what we see when they chose Matthias to be the 12th apostle among the 11. If you remember, they prayed there and then they cast lots. They kind of took a gamble. But here they prayed, they laid their hands on them, and notice what we have in verse 7. And the word of God increased you know were it not for this wisdom that undoubtedly comes from the direction of the Holy Spirit in dwelling God's people and particularly the apostles who have been anointed and appointed by the Lord Jesus Christ himself you could expect that something like this would divide the church and you'd have a Greek church over here and a Hebrew church over here and no one getting along at all because that's the human way. But to be able to take a mix of people and cultures that are diverse, languages whereby there are those who don't understand one another and need someone as a translator like we often do here at KCCC to be able to can I say it like this pull this off in a peaceful orderly fashion that actually contributes to the growth of the church rather than being something that could have been a huge blow up between these needy widowed women and the grumbling regarding unfairness and the sense of neglect amongst one group. The word of God increased. The number of disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. And a great company of the priests no, that's, that's leadership in the Jewish community, the non-Christian Jewish community coming to Christ. This is a real accomplishment. I, I need to be careful saying this, but perhaps they had never seen such unity. They perhaps had never seen such harmony among themselves. 
And here, as they watch this difficulty, rather than turning into a hornet's nest of trouble, it settled out peacefully, successfully, and actually was a part of growth and encouragement as people come together with all of their differences, with all of the issues that would, we could say, divide them and create utter chaos, the church grows, and even what we would consider to be some of the most difficult outsiders, they are obedient to the faith. I, I want to talk about that for just a moment. Uh, there's been a question, and I've had it several times, people say to me, well, what do you mean by obedient to the faith? Uh, what do you mean by obey the gospel? Uh, what do you mean by using that? I thought that salvation, I thought the message of the gospel was not having to do with works or having to follow a particular set of rules and such. What is this obedience to the faith? What do we mean when we speak of those who obey the gospel? Well, uh, can I say it like this? In every aspect of life, when something is introduced, when there is a need, when there is an issue that has to be accomplished, there is a desired result, and, and there's chaos. The, de the result that is desired is when those that are called upon, those that are introduced, those that, in the case of the gospel, in the case of the message of salvation, hear the word, what is the desired result? That they might receive it. That they might listen, and by the Holy Spirit, faith coming by hearing and hearing by the word of God, that those who are under the sound of the gospel, and that's our feeling as we preach this morning, that those who are under the sound of the gospel be dealt with, encouraged by the Holy Spirit of God to respond in such a way that they receive Christ as their Savior. That's obedience to the word. That's obedience of faith. That's obedience to the gospel. Um, a young man meets a young lady. Uh, he desires that their relationship grows. He looks for things in that relationship to develop. And there comes a time where he presents a proposal to her. Uh, we, we know what it is when we have a friend or friends and uh, the word comes up. Did you know that? Tommy uh, proposed to Judy last night. And we go like, oh, wow. And, and, and then what do we say? Did she accept? Uh, because even in a marriage proposal, when some suggestion, important suggestion like that is put forth, what is the desired result? Acceptance. In, in my case, I... I remember clearly the night that I presented a diamond ring to Sherry. And, oh my goodness, I, I, I hardly got the box open and she knew what it was and she responded and it was just, it was just a wonderful thing. Well, what, what do you think I would have felt or how do you think that my proposal would have turned out if she had looked at the ring and said, you know, I really prefer white gold. Or if she had looked at the ring and said, nice ring and everything, but that old Volvo that you're driving, something needs to happen because I'm embarrassed every time we go out. What if she had said to me, this is a two bedroom house and suppose we end up with children. This house isn't gonna be sufficient. I need you to, I need you to sweeten the deal. A little. <laughs> I'm telling you, that ring would go right back in the box and back in my pocket, and I'm not sure she'd be inv invited back to my house. Now, I'm being a little extreme here, but you get the idea. I was looking for her to be obedient to my offer and to respond in the desired way. And 
She did. Some 29, almost 30 years ago. So, obedience to faith means responding positively. Responding in the way that is desired and satisfactory to the proposal or to the offer. Verse 8. And Stephen, full of faith and power. Remember we were talking... We were talking about the qualifications of these guys. I mean, these are guys that are going to be serving soup for the heaven's sake. Yeah, I guess for the heaven's sake. They're going to be they're going to be waiting on tables. They're going to be taking care of. Can I say grumpy old ladies? Oh, come on! But nevertheless, God has within His requirements that they be honest, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. And those were appointed over this business. And in verse 8, we come to Stephen. He's full of faith and power. Not only that, he did great wonders and miracles among the people. <laughs> you, you mean to say that this, and I'm gonna I'm gonna suggest young man chosen to do food service is out in full faith and power, and he's actually doing wonders and miracles. He's functioning as the apostles. He's, we would say, gifted beyond his calling. No, God had a greater calling upon Stephen's life. And I want to say to you this morning that there's a need for the church in the regard of those that are called to serve us in our church, we make reference to the COC, the Council of Co-workers. And I look at those individuals that are chosen who respond positively to the offer and I seek out in them whether or not they have the ability for leadership, the ability perhaps to take on a little more than what their initial responsibility was to teach a Sunday school class. Now, we have members of our COC, of our service board, that are here every Sunday that we have a baptism and they're getting the equipment out and they're filling the tank and they're checking the temperature of the water and they're putting down the, the uh, runway, if you will, for the the people who are being baptized to uh, come out of the tank and so forth and so on. And afterwards, they're putting it all away and drying it out and it's back in the, it's back in the uh, cupboard where we keep it. And I, I look at these men and women also and they go like, wow. Um, and I, I have to say, I expect further, I expect bigger things from them. And we've seen it happen. Our Mandarin pastor here at KCCC, Pastor James, was one of our members. He, he showed wonderful leadership ability and so forth. In fact, I think I might have been one of the first people to approach him after Pastor Michael had left and say, James, have you considered that God may be calling you to the ministry? And over a period of time, and sensing that leading of the Holy Spirit, uh, we found ourselves a Mandarin speaking leader, pastor here at our church that came right out of the congregation. I, I look at Stephen and I say, here's a man that responded to the, the, the footwork and the service work that he was called upon to do but he was gifted above and beyond that and he followed the leading of the Spirit of God. Then, verse 9, there arose certain of the synagogue, the Jewish lecture house, the reading room where Jews would come together to hear the word of God. There arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines, and Cyrenians and Alexandrians 
also some from Cilicia and of Asia, which would be present day Turkey, who began arguing with Stephen. Um, you get a real quick understanding here that Stephen was up to it. Uh, it's interesting that these men who have, it would seem, philosopher titles and associations approach Stephen, who has been called to serve tables, and they get involved in disputing, they get involved in discourse with him. Verse 10 says that they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. Can I, can I say to you as a church, can I say to you as members of the body of Christ, don't limit a person to one thing because they responded to it. I had a friend who had amazing musical ability and the church that he was going to gave him a Sunday school class and he did that for years when he had the ability to be the director of the choir and to lead their music ministry and they never took advantage of that and finally when he got an offer somewhere else he went to another church and was used of God in a wonderful uh, I'm going to say in a miraculous way and the initial church just shut him in a Sunday school classroom and I don't think they said this to him but by their actions they said now just stay there uh, the church at Jerusalem didn't put a limit on Stephen. And when he went out and he was mixing with and conferring with these members of these synagogue groups, this man's ability and wisdom just excelled in, to the point that these, can, can I say know-it-alls? When they were not able to resist his wisdom and the spirit by which he spake, they suborned men. They actually went out and found people that said, that brought false accusation against Stephen. They falsely accused him. We've heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And they stirred up the people. And the elders and the scribes came upon him and they arrested him and brought him before the council. They're going to give him his day in court, but let's see how that was handled. They set up false witnesses, which said, this man will not stop speaking blasphemous words against this holy place and against the law. So now their allegations have expanded. It started out with speaking against blaspheming Moses and God, and now they've added two more charges. Speaking against Moses, speaking against God's spokesperson, speaking against God, blaspheming God, blaspheming this holy place, the temple, and the word of God, the law. Four charges brought against a wonderful man of God who was willing to step out and expand his abilities and opportunities and just, uh, my goodness, what is a, he, Stephen's one of those people that uh, if you were to see him, you'd say, I wonder what he'd do if given the chance. And the opportunity was presented. He stepped out by faith and remarkably was a testimony for the name of Christ and for the truth of God. And they determined in their minds and heart, even to the point of this thing of suburning, they actually hired false accu accusation, hired false accusers against him to shut him down. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth is going to destroy this place. And I'm sure they took the words of Jesus 
destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it again. That came up against Jesus when he was in trial. Now they're leveling the same thing against Stephen. Destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered unto us. And all that sat in the council, looking steadfastly on him, saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. And that's the last verse of this chapter. And if you haven't already gone and read chapter 7, and I imagine you have, and come to the end of chapter 7, you would probably think, well, you know, with that uh, that countenance, that appearance, it's going to all work out just fine. I mean, here you are, a guy that as they questioned him before, he wasn't without answers. They couldn't, uh, they, 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 they just couldn't stand up against. They couldn't resist his wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. You're going to be all right, Stevie boy. Well, when we come to chapter 7, and chapter 7 is quite long. By the way, chapter 7 is a wonderful synopsis. It's a, it's a wonderful narrative that takes us from, I mean, my goodness, uh, God's appearing to Abraham, takes us up through the kingdom of King David and all of these, and the failure of the Jews to continue steadfast in the things of God. And um, in verse 54, it says that when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart. That's the third time we've read this in the book of Acts. They were cut to the heart. And I don't want to tell you the rest of the story this morning, but things didn't work out well with Stephen. Stephen is known as the first martyr of the church. And it's grievous to see that, man, the, he knew his Bible from, from start to finish, what he had of it. He had the Old Testament down like the back of his hand. And he testified of the word of God and all that was against him were false accusations. But Stephen is an example to us of those that are willing to contend for the faith even if it costs us all that we are and have. Stephen followed the Lord Jesus Christ and if there's an example of taking up one's cross, we have that in this man, one of the first of the seven deacons appointed in the book of, of Acts, appointed in the church at Jerusalem, did all that he could do, did it well, and went above and beyond what appeared to be his call of duty, and you might say, well, it sure didn't work out for him. We haven't read the rest of the story, but let me tell you this, great is his reward. He will be amongst those in the book of Revelation that in the very end will rule and reign those that have given their lives for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Amen. A true servant with a true servant's heart. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for examples in the scripture. We thank you for the word of God that tells us of men that were chosen specifically. Uh, Nicholas, who was a Greek. Uh, others of this group of seven that each had their own particular and specific abilities. And then we come to Stephen. But we're going to read about Philip later on in a couple of chapters. And Philip also had a calling above and beyond that of simply serving tables. And we pray, our God, that we would open our mind and heart, that we would be obedient to your word, that we give an opportunity to serve you in what might seem to be a menial task would say, yes, Lord, I will serve you because I love you. You have given life to me. I was nothing before you found me. You've given life to me. 
and that we would be willing to lay it all down at the feet of our master that we might serve you acceptably and rightly with godly fear in an adulterous and sinful generation. Bless us, we pray. Bless your word to our heart and bless your people as we seek to serve you in the life that you've laid before us for your glory and for the upbuilding of your kingdom. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And we've got a closing song. I will serve you because I love you. You have given life to me. I was nothing before you found me. You have given life to me. Heartaches, broken pieces, ruin lives are why you died on Calvary. Your touch was what I longed for. You have given life to me. Yeah.